in the first uh, lecture of, uh, on, on Monday evening, one of the comments uh, the speaker made was the idea that a lot of these debates are about how we use particular words to name the phenomena that we're talking about, the technical phenomena. And I want to say that in, in focusing on a few of the technical terms that appear in our discourse, I'm not intending to police the use of these words. It's not that I'm saying this is the correct way to name these phenomena and we must use the words in exactly the way that I'm going to be proposing. Instead, what I'm actually pointing to um, are some distinctions, some ways of, 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 of seeing differences between the phenomena that sometimes the words we're currently using aren't particularly helpful, particularly because people are using the words in different ways or because there are um, conflations where a, a, a one word is being used um, to do two jobs and, and so on. So part of what I'm doing in this exercise is going to be um, pulling apart some of the notions that we, we're commonly talking about and, and trying to get a, a clearer view of how they all fit together in a helpful way. So you may use some of these terms differently. And certainly if we look to the history of the, the debates about photography, terms like recording, and I could add a few more as well, reproducing, rendering, and so on, those will crop up. Um, some of these terms are used in different ways. Um, and, and part of what I hope we can do as a conversation with one another is to work out how we can understand the relationships between these, these terms in a way that avoids confusion. I should also say that I think bearing in mind what an international uh, group of languages we have represented at this event as well, that one of the uh, issues that we face is that the terminology doesn't always line up with different languages. So the distinction between registering and recording that I might talk about um, for example, in, in French, that distinction doesn't come out quite the same way in English, and a distinction between image and picture that we have in English doesn't come out quite the same way in German, and I'm sure that there are many other examples in different languages. So any illumination that, the, uh, that we can bring to this um, would be great as a group. So um, obviously, I'm, uh, I've, I've immensely enjoyed listening to historians and scientists talking about their subject. And what I am presenting for you here is primarily a philosophical approach to the, the, the subject area. So I'm not picking on any particular philo philosophical theories or thinkers. It's not a fine grained account of what's going on in analytic philosophy of photography. It's more of a general abstract, uh, what I would call a sort of snapshot of the way that the debate has developed and how we can understand some of the ideas and commitments and conclusions that seem to frame the debate um, as we stand. Now, I hope that you will see parallels in your own disciplines. I think in, in, in photography theory, in art history, in uh, 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 practitioners of photography, you will recognize these moves, but I'm principally talking about how we find them in a philosophical debate. So if we're gonna give a snapshot of the philosophy of photography, we can start with something that we can presumably agree on, which is photographs are a kind of visual representation. I'm not gonna elaborate these points in great detail. I'm just going to move through how we might see the inquiry developing. So if photographs are a kind of visual representation. We can find ourselves asking the question, well, how are photographs distinct from other kinds of visual representations? that we may be familiar with, standardly drawings, engravings, paintings, and so on. One way of uh, finding an immediate answer to that is to look at the way that we're intrigued by photographs. What, what grips us about the way that we uh, experience them, use them? And generally speaking, an answer seems to be that photographs are visual representations with some kind of special relation to reality. I'm not going to start entering a philosophical discussion about reality, um, especially not the reality of, of uh, holes and so on, as we found in the first lecture. But by reality, I just mean here the photographed scene. So this presents us with another question. How do we explain the relation between a photograph and the photographed scene? And if we're looking for an explanatory account of why a photograph has a particular peculiar relation to a photograph scene, we turn to an understanding of the nature of the technology, the nature of the photographic production process. And the answer that you will probably be anticipating is something like this. Photography is a recording medium. And part of what's meant by it being a recording medium is that 
the images produced by a photographic process have a reproductive relation to uh, the, the scene or the image um, that means that visual properties of the uh, record the recorded image um, match the, uh, the the source um, so we, we have a recording and I'll, I'm going to be talking quite a bit about what we understand by recording but in some general sense the technology is a recording technology and that's what um, explains the relationship between a photograph and a photograph scene. Now, a consequence, if we accept this cascade of moves in this way, is that we arrive at the point where if photography is a recording medium, then photographs are a particular kind of visual representation, and specifically, they are representational records of the photograph scene. So they are both representations and they have a, the status of being records of the photograph scene. Okay. Now, the problem with that we face uh, with the idea, if we, if we accept this move that photographic images are representations that have accompanied by the status of recording, their recording representation, it seems like it gives us an answer to the question we were first interested in, the distinction between photographic images and other kinds of non-photographic images. We can, of course, put cinematic images or other things that have photographic origin on the photographic side of this if we wish. But broadly speaking, the distinction between photographic and non-photographic images is one that means, uh, that points to the nature of the recording technology that underpins photographic images and is absent in the case of non-photographic images. Um, again, this, this distinction, if we accept it, brings a number of consequences. And we can see these consequences articulated in numerous theories across the debate and discourse. So I'm just trying to generalize here about the claim. Again, I'm not putting these words in the mouth of any particular thinker, but I can hope you can recognize um, the long history of conceiving of a distinction between types of image in this way. So fundamentally, we're claiming that the image properties of a photographic image have been determined mind independently. The, the process, the technological process by which the, the image acquires its properties um, has not had intervention from human agency in a way that means that the properties are there because a human being um, modified them in particular ways. The contrast is that fundamentally the image properties of drawings, paintings, engravings are there because a, a, a human mind uh, determined that that's the properties that should appear. Um, again, put it more straightforwardly, if you're faced with an empty plate, a photographer must record an empty plate. Com uh, by comparison, faced with an empty plate, perhaps the same empty plate, a painter can depict a plate that is empty, broken, or fruit laden. I could think of this as being a sort of um, the, the, the glass is half empty theory of photography, I think. Um, but of course, this is in no way to deny that a photographer has um, a lot of intentional control over the representational content of a photograph. Um, but Put in, in very uh, stark terms like this, the contrast is designed to make you think that the way that a photographer has representational control over the content of, of the image has to be some sort of modification of the scene. So the photographer is going to have to break the plate or fill the plate with fruit to gain uh, that sort of representational control or in a post-processing sense, uh, may have to work with double exposure or um, modifications in, in the printing process stage to be able to arrive at a comparable degree of uh, content control that the painter or, or draftsman is going to be able to have um, for free. So this paints as a, a picture of, of two strikingly different um, types of representation. Now, this poses a problem, and I take this as speaking to an underlying theme um, in, in most of the papers of the conference and then the nature of the conference as a whole, which is about the relation between the epistemic and aesthetic applications of photography. And I'm, I, I'm well aware that I'm, I'm pushing at an open door here that most of the speakers 
have um, elaborated in, in really illuminating ways the idea that the practitioners of photography are, um, are, are not, cons are not um, isolated in just having epistemic or aesthetic application. The interplay between the, the epistemic and the aesthetic considerations um, by photography practitioners is a key feature of what most of the speakers have been able to show us um, with, with really interesting discussion. So I know that, that what I, where I'm going with this is going to speak, I think, to your sympathies. But at this stage, I'm presenting you with how we arrive at a kind of dead end. And the dead end that we, we get to is the idea that the aesthetic and, and aesthetic and epistemic applications are zero sum. In other words, the more you get of one, the less you, you get of the other. And it works like this. If, as the picture I've just painted, is that the photographic process is inherently well suited to epistemic representation, then it seems consequently it's ill suited to aesthetic representation. You can only really get the mind dependent aesthetic or artistic input by tampering with the nature of the photographic process. And if you do that, if you adapt the photographic process with considerable intervention and post-processing to suit aesthetic and artistic representation, the idea is you lose something in terms of the um, epistemic um, information carrying uh, aspects of the discipline. So this is a dead end. This is where we don't really want to be, the zero sum um, outcome. So what I want to speak to is, is something that I, I hope will unlock this. The way I see it is that ideas about photography have become tangled up and pulled so tight that we've, we've, we've knotted up our thinking. Um, and what I'm trying to do in my own work and in a little contribution towards that in this talk is to start pulling apart some of the ideas that have become so tightly bound together that they're conflated and compressed and we, we don't even notice um, how they fit together any longer. So I'm just trying to loosen some of these threads and pull them apart in a way that's going to be more, um, well, mean we can do, do more with them for one thing. So a contribution to that is to say that our understanding of the photographic process, going right the way back to the pioneers of photography and the earliest reception of photography and up to the present day, um, I think has a, a common um, picture to it and a common knot that has been tied together, which is a conception that the photographic process is single stage. And against that, I am introducing and proposing and supporting the idea that the photographic process is multi-stage. Any of you who are thinking, well, every uh, photographic process is multi-stage. Yes, clearly everything is going to involve lots of different steps. It's not quite what I mean by the contrast between single stage and multi-stage. So I'm going to elaborate um, in, the, in the next uh, part what that difference actually is. Um, uh, but the contrast I'm just painting for you here is, is this knot that we've tied ourselves in. What I'm claiming is that if you are committed to the idea that the photographic processing is single stage, then you are going to accept that photography is a recording medium and that it is fundamentally and necessarily a recording medium because that's what the single stage view will commit you to. If you think it's a recording medium, then by its very nature, every photographic image that's a product of that technology must be a representational record in the way that I've described. And that's how we end up with the zero sum problem for art and science. By contrast, if we go in the direction of the right way of thinking about the photographic process, you can, you can see I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not even hiding my, uh, my bias here. Um, if, we, if we go down the route uh, of exploring the idea that a photographic process is multi-stage in a way that I'd like to spell out, then we find out that photography is indeed a recording medium. I'm not denying that it's a recording medium but it's a recording medium un understood in terms of how it is functionally um, uh, working and, and it is contingently a recording medium. So it's not that the very nature of the photographic process involves recording. It's rather that the photographic process is um, preeminently well suited to recording, but it isn't necessarily a recording medium. The consequence of that is that many, perhaps even most, photographs are representational records, but not all. It's going to contingently depend on the process stages. 
and consequently we can avoid this zero sum outcome because if many but not all photographs are representational records then the suitability for art and science is broadened out so we can kind of untangle the knot that we um, we ended up with and we've, we've got more room for maneuver so that that gives you the overall structure of the contrast that I, I think is important here and now it remains for me to convince you that you don't want a single stage view and you do want a multi-stage view I'm not of course um, presupposing that you do have a single stage view but I want you to be able to look to the history of discourse about photography and recognize that the single stage view it predominates uh, all of that discourse. And I mean, uh, not just historians, but also photographers themselves um, and other people writing about it. So let's have a look at something that we would all agree on and, and whether or not your single stage or, or multi-stage uh, account of photography, here's where you start. So the preliminary step of a photographic process is that light from a scene in front of camera apparatus is channeled and focused to project an optical light image. We can look to how we extend this debate for non-visible um, wavelengths and so on, but I'm, I want to simplify matters. I'm just gonna be talking here about visible light and optical light images, the kind of image you find inside a camera obscura or here in, in, a, in a Hasselblad um, viewfinder. So the optical light image, if we were looking at it for real, is causally dependent on the scene in front of a camera and it's temporally active. It means that its visual properties change according to changes in the light sources and the movement of objects and of course the movement of the camera and the camera setting. So there, there are dynamic uh, properties, visual properties of this image. And it's worth noting that the image, when you, the optical image when you see it is both um, produced by projected light um, arriving on a surface and it's also a reflection of the actual object so although it's not a mirror it's not a, a, a mirror reflection one way of, of thinking about it is when you are looking at the optical light image there is a sense in which you are um, perce perceiving the scene itself via its reflection in the optical light image so that's a very beautiful uh, uh, picture here so that's what we agree on where do we go from here well uh, back to the early 19th century, we learn that uh, Monsieur Daguerre has discovered a method to fix the images that are represented at the back of a camera obscura. So those images are not the temporary reflection of the object, but they're fixed and durable impress, which may be removed from the presence of those objects like a picture engraving. This is the motivating um, fantasy that uh, the pioneers of photography tell us about. And I want to say this is the kind of thing that's the origin of the single stage view of photography. And in crucial respects, it is just a fantasy. I'm going to be contrasting the single stage and multi-stage view. So anybody who holds a single stage account of photography believes that um, there is a moment in the photographic process when a photograph is taken. And of course, typically we're talking here about the exposure. So during exposure, when the photograph is taken, for a particular time interval, short or long, a photosensitive surface is exposed to light from the scene. And as soon as that exposure has finished, you have your photograph. Your photograph has been captured, seized, arrested, stored, and the photograph exists once it has been taken. It's stored as a latent image on undeveloped film or as a digital file. So the single stage view is called single stage because the photograph comes into existence at that first stage. There are, of course, further stages of the process. The photograph still needs to be developed, printed, screened, many other things will be done with it. But crucially, the photograph itself exists at this stage. This is why it's called single stage. Subsequent stages are just ways of dealing with the photograph that was created at the first stage. The multi-stage view by comparison, I, I've introduced this terminology, um, instead of talking about an exposure, I talk about a photographic event. So we have the occurrence of a photographic event. So for a time interval, there is causal registration of the light that is projecting the optical light image. In other words, light is causing sensitivity expects to appear in a silver halide emulsion, or it's causing electrical charge that will be converted into a signal um, for storage in, in, in an electronic device. 
um, and that's the registering of the light. So registration of the light means um, you might think of it as being counting or tallying the position and intensity of the light arriving during that time period. It's simply a tallying up of that information and storing the information. So when the photographic event ends, we have the existence of a photographic register, something that carries the information about um, how much light has arrived and, and where it, it was distributed. But the photographic register that exists is not an imagistic storage of information. It isn't yet an image. Um, and there's a very simple way of thinking about this. If, if you think about the, the idea of a digital camera producing a, um, a file um, straight after uh, a photographic event has taken place. I think it's, it's quite easy to be able to understand that that is just stored information, but it isn't yet an image. It's harder, I think, to accept that when it comes to the notion of a latent image. And one of the uh, pieces of work I've written on recently is, is explaining why I think a latent image is a misnomer and that there is no image in a latent image. Um, but the idea of the photographic register is that the um, exposed but undeveloped film is a register, but it is not yet an image. So we need two stages in the multi-stage process. Um, unlike the single stage where at this moment in time an image exists, the multi-stage account requires a second stage necessarily before a photograph comes into existence. So a visual, visual image needs to be rendered from the register, and that can happen by developing the film or putting the um, the digital file through um, an appropriate processing um, algorithm. And once we have a visual image um, rendered using the information from the register, which had its causal provenance in a photographic event, a photograph now exists. So you can see, I hope, the difference between why I call them single stage and multi-stage um, points. Now, where are we going with this? Well, what I was wanting to, to specifically um, explain in, in this talk and for the purpose of this, um, this conversation is to explain why it is that if you hold a single stage account of photography, you end up with a conception of photography as a recording medium that, is, uh, that misrepresents the, the recording process. As I said, it, it, it leaves us in the position of thinking that recording is necessary rather than contingent. And it happens like this because what seems to be happening, we think, uh, in, the, in the single stage is that a photosensitive surface autonomously reproduces a light image. Um, that's the fantasy that we have about the latent image is that it has, um, it has reproduced the image um, already. And if the image is autonomously reproduced without intervention, from a human being, for example, then photography is necessarily a recording medium because the reproduction, the photographic image, is a mind independent playback of the source that it was recording. And that's what leads us, as we've seen, to the idea that every photographic image is fundamentally a representational record because it's the product of a recording of this kind. It can't be anything else if you accept a single stage account. And uh, to see a, a, a Philosopher John, John Corvicki's work on recording and representation is, is wonderful philosophical work about recording and representation. Um, but in a key respect, we find deep in it what I think of as a single stage view of photography. So I think he's right about everything he says about recording and representing, but only up to a point because here is something that needs to be modified. He notes that in daguerreotypes, the pattern burned into a sheet of silver records a pattern of light and dark and also serves as a playback of that pattern because it is the pattern of light and dark that was recorded. Just look and you see reproduced the pattern that caused it. So we've got the idea here that when you look at a daguerreotype, you are seeing the image that uh, reproduced itself autonomously during the exposure. But I'm suggesting that that's just not true. Um, the image we're looking at in a daguerreotype is a developed image, an image that has been rendered in the second stage of the process. So um, we know, for example, that uh, 
latent images require the secondary stage, but see it again here, the single stage view, the image of immobile objects becomes perfectly imprinted on the plate, although the image is yet invisible. Before application of mercury, there does not exist any distinct image, although these images have already been set down and set down forever. So the fantasy here is that the image has been fully reproduced, secured at the first stage. And the secondary stage of development is merely bringing into visibility the image that's already there. And that's what I'm denying. I'm saying that a multi-stage um, conception of photography means that you have um, information registered in the first stage, but the development stage is not merely making visible an image that already exists. It's bringing into existence an image for the first time. And the image that comes into existence uh, through the development process is an image that gains some of its image properties through the, pr the secondary processing stage. So in order to arrive at an, the, an, an image with determinate properties, we have to have both the uh, registration and the rendering and the image properties are a combination of those two stages. So I've just shown you how, where we end up with, uh, with a single stage um, uh, idea of recording. Now let me show you what happens with a multi-stage view of recording. So with a multi-stage account, the first step is that light is registered. The second step is that an image is rendered. An image does not exist at the first stage. And what's crucial to the conception of recording is that photography is indeed a recording medium. It's an exemplary recording medium, but that's not because um, reproduction happens in the first step. It's only contingently a recording medium because whether or not it successfully uh, produces a reproduction of its source will depend not just on one of these stages, but on the relationship between the two stages. So whether or not the, the image, the visible image is a reproduction of the source will depend not only on how the information was registered in the first step, but how that information has been, um, uh, has been rendered through to the second step. So there's a relationship between these two. And the image rendering methods that we need to talk about, we need to talk about whether those image rendering methods um, are standardized or whether they have non-standard interventions in them, whether they are uh, manually enacted, whether they are automated. Um, and bear in mind that what's typically been talked of as being um, fully automated in image rendering methods actually are typically just a, a way of, of saying that the process is standardized. What really matters about whether the image properties are mind independent or mind dependent is going to be whether um, a a uh, prescribed set of steps have been taken that would be repeatable and generate the same outcomes, or whether there have been um, non-standard interventions and other ways of relating the registered information to the rendered image. Um, but both of these possibilities are available to us. So a photographic image may function as a representational record if there has been an appropriate relationship between the registered information and the rendered image, then it may function as a mind independent representational record. But if there have been other forms of mind dependent intervention um, in between the registration of light and the rendering of the image, then it may not be a representational record. And the crucial point is that rather than having as our paradigm for a photograph, the mind independent representational case and thinking that only an image of that kind is a true photograph. The multi-stage account makes us see that both of these um, image rendering processes have an equal right to call themselves the products of a photographic process. Um, and we can think about image rendering methods here as being, for example, artistic methods contrasted with scientific methods and think about broadly then about all the different uh, ways that that's been described in the conference as a whole. So I'll just, um, that's the main point that I really wanted to make. So I will start to, to wrap up. I said to you that what I was trying to do is pull apart some aspects of the photographic process that I think normally get conflated. So in a single stage view where you point a camera to scene, take a photograph and you have 
a, uh, the image reproduces itself in the camera. If we pull it apart, we can see how we are going to epistemically and aesthetically take an interest in more than just the photographed scene as seen through the recorded image. We can take an interest in the scene, the optical light image. We can take an aesthetic and epistemic interest in the photographic event itself. And we, I'd be happy to talk about that, about the nature of the register, about the methods involved in image rendering, about the status of a photographic image, and also the status of a photographic picture. As I said, this will only work um, if we're interested in, in, in how to generate an image picture distinction, but this example might um, help. So I've, I've outlined, I think I, I, can, uh, I can say if I come back to this, that um, I'm hoping that what I've said so far will show you why the multi-stage method um, can deliver for us this distinction, uh, this way of understanding that photography is a recording medium without committing ourselves to the idea that every photograph is a representational method. So let's just contrast two examples and this will finish um, what I want to say. I was very struck, I just took this example straightforwardly from Kelly Wilder's talk yesterday when she, she talked about extended notebooks of um, cloud form. So I take it that, the, that uh, Charles and Jessica Smith are producing representational records of scenes where it matters what the specific time and place is and they are using standardized image rendering processes with a great degree of technical mastery and they are systematically um, uh, recording information about uh, when and where and how each image was created. Um, and that, of course, fits under the idea of a scientific method and approach, and it also fits the idea of photography as a recording medium to produce representational records. But now imagine, faced with the same optical light image that we see in the viewfinder, um, we position it differently and um, contrast the work of Alfred Stieglitz, who produced um, a series, uh, hundreds of images of um, cloud formations. Um, in, and in particular, I have in mind a series called The Equivalents that he produced between 1925 and 1934. Now, these works are um, absolutely um, groundbreaking as works of artistic abstraction where the cloud images that he presented were divorced from any reference points of time and space. He, he, wasn't, uh, he, he certainly wouldn't have been including horizon lines or uh, human beings included for scale or any of the other features that we've, we've seen that, that tie an image to a particular information, knowledge gathering relation to what's being seen. Um, and crucially, his cloud images can be viewed from any way up and they can be viewed in any sequence and they were exhibited in, in many times in different orders. So the idea of any accompanying epistemic um, metadata with these images, again, is, is not part of the image rendering method and exhibition method. So I want to say of, of his work by comparison, that although we might say that the subject matter and maybe the optical light image of, of two different um, types of work may have been the same. His work does not consist of representational records of the photographed scene. Um, and if we have a multi-stage account, we are much better placed to understand why both of these types of photography sit happily with each other and not in a zero sum relation. So um, anybody who might be interested to see how the multi-stage event is developed, um, those of you who are watching this in a recorded form will be able to uh, pause the screen and look at that. The rest of you, I can, uh, I can send you an email of some reading, but I, I wanted to suggest some, some reading that might interest you if you want to see work that's been done um, on this, and I'll be glad to have a discussion to get your thoughts about it. Thank you very much.